Well, the technology was invented by surgeons originally, and it was a problem solver because they encountered common difficulties because of blocked chest strains. And so that was a, a great inconvenience, and of course for the patient sometimes dangerous. What we discovered in our research subsequently was that the retained blood is, is more than an inconvenience. M many of the common morbidities, and sometimes even mortality, is directly related to not evacuating blood properly after the initial surgery. And so, in fact, we've been dealing with retained blood ever since there has been surgery. Anytime blood is left behind in the body, the body no longer owns it. It regards it as a foreign body, and it treats it uh, with the autoimmune system in the same way it treats infection. So blood, in fact, is a toxic waste, and what our technology does is remove the toxic waste from the body much more effectively. And in doing that, the blood uh, cannot cause the problems that it is uh, ca causing up to this time. And those, those problems are very common. For example, uh, pleural effusions, which is water around the organs, especially the lungs or the heart, is very common. Maybe half of patients have pleural effusions after surgery. And of course, there's several causes, but one of the causes is blood. Uh, we know now also that post-operative atrial fibrillation, what we call uh, POAF, is also triggered by retained blood. Now, POAF is a complex problem. Uh, there are many, many possible other triggers, including things like the age of the patient and obesity and the age of the heart and, and so on. But we know that if you look at two groups of patients, one of whom has uh, a dry thorax after the surgery and one of whom has left blood behind. In the group where there's blood left in the chest, the post-operative atrial fibrillation rate is much higher in that group. And equally, if you remove the blood, as we have done in our, in our research, the post-operative atrial fibrillation rate goes down. So think about retained blood as a kind of root cause of many problems. It's not uh, solely responsible for one thing or another, and it lives in an environment of risk with, with many risk factors. So what we teach our sales reps is to talk about it like alcohol and driving. Mm -hmm. If you don't drink, you, you cannot be promised that you will not die in a car crash. You could die for many other reasons, including stupidity. But uh, when you drink and drive, the risk of death or injury goes up dramatically. So after surgery, there is always inherent risk from many factors. But with retained blood, those risk factors become much worse. And if you don't drink and drive, or if you remove the retained blood, then the risk uh, decreases for the patient. And in all of our studies, and we have many published manuscripts now, a lot of uh, patients have received our device, almost 50,000, uh, we see a dramatic improvement in the patient uh, conditions after their initial surgery. We see less post op AFib, we see less pleural effusions, we see less pericardial effusions. And so what started out as a tool, a convenience, if you like, for surgeons, has, has turned into this phenomenon that we call retained blood syndrome, which is now a composite of endpoints. Retained blood syndrome is any of these possible complications which is related to the single root cause of retained blood. So there's a lot of wisdom in uh, all of our cultures about avoiding problems instead of solving them. <laughs> a stitch in time saves time. Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and so on. Uh, retained blood is something to be avoided. And if you look at the value of avoiding retained blood, uh, we can see the impact across uh, all of the dimensions in care. Uh, obviously the patient is the most important one. We want to save lives, we want to reduce suffering, decrease pain and have them leave hospital healthier and faster. Uh, for the nurses, it's less worry, it's less work because they're, they're dealing less frequently with these complications. For the surgeons, obviously, having a patient come back to the operating room is a, is a catastrophe, usually, and sometimes uh, it doesn't end well for the patient. The, re the mortality from reoperation is much higher than the first operation. So when we look at the, the, the kinds of complications we avoid, we, we put them on a time axis from the immediate phase, what we call the acute phase, all the way out to a year, sometimes. And the acute phase, uh, we can talk about uh, cardiac tamponade, for example. This is where blood accumulates in the chest and around the heart. And if that happens, you have to imagine that the heart is being suffocated. Uh, the blood around the heart impedes filling of the heart chambers and it impedes pumping of the blood out of the heart. Now, that's a very important uh, issue for the body because when that happens, the blood pressure goes down, 
the kidneys don't receive enough blood and we start to see kidney damage at a time when it, the body is already stressed. And so acute tamponade and uh, pericardial effusions, which result from fluid accumulating around the heart because of the inflammation caused by the blood around the heart, uh, we can see that this problem can start immediately, sometimes within minutes or hours after the surgery. Uh, usually at day two or day three, if there's blood, we see fluid accumulating in the chest. Because I mentioned earlier that the process by which blood is removed is uh, an autoimmune response. Uh, white cells are recruited, water is brought in to dissolve the clot, and a lot of uh, chemicals are released to try to dissolve the clot. So we see fibrinolysis, thrombinolysis, hemolysis, and we see uh, increased levels of inflammatory markers, cytokinins, prostaglandins, interleukinins, and all of those things are highly elevated because of retained blood. So when you remove the blood, all of those inflammatory markers go down, and the consequences of that inflammation also is therefore reduced. So again, it's a root cause when you avoid the autoimmune response to this clot, you don't get TPA elevated, you don't get thrombinolysis, fibrinolysis, then everything improves. And in fact, in our studies, one interesting uh, dimension is that patients who receive our device actually bleed less. Now, that's a little bit counterintuitive because we thought at the beginning, if you keep the chest drain open, you should get more blood out. Yes. In fact, we saw the opposite. When uh, our device is inserted, we got less blood out. And still the tube was open. So something else must be happening. And now we know what is happening because we measured the biomarkers. When the blood is removed in the early stages, all of this inflammatory response is avoided. And that inflammatory response, in turn, cannot cause more bleeding. The surgeons all know that bleeding begets bleeding. That's what they say. Many times they will do a washout. They just open the patient and wash out the blood. And there is no active blood in the chest. They just remove clot. When they close up, that's the end of the story. The patient is better. So we know that getting the blood out can actually improve hemostasis. So coagulopathic states, which means the tendency of the patient to continue bleeding after surgery, sometimes is made worse by the presence of blood itself in the body. So getting the blood out causes the patient to heal faster, to dry up faster, they lose less blood, and we saw in our most recent American study that the direct consequence of that is that the patient actually receives less transfusions. And of course many hospitals have a stated goal to avoid blood transfusion because that's associated with injuries in its own right. So uh, getting the blood out has many benefits. It's like washing your hands, or as I mentioned earlier, it's like not drinking and driving, or not drinking and operating machinery. In terms of tips for anybody who's operating in surgery, I would say, first of all, recall that the, the first obligation is to do no harm, to, to avoid injury to the patient. And when we learn of new techniques and new technologies which can reduce the suffering in the human condition, which can make injury less common, which can make complications less common, we have an ethical obligation, first of all, to, uh, to explore the value of that. Now, practically, in a modern setting, there has to be a cost-benefit. So what is the cost benefit of avoiding these complications? Well, of course, for the family, leaving hospital sooner can, can be a big deal. Getting back to work earlier can be a big deal. But for the hospital, if they are in a situation where the number of ICU beds is a problem, usually the occupancy rate in the intensive care is very high, having somebody leave the ICU a day early means that the operating room can operate on more patients. That's a convenience. Uh, for the surgeon, leaving after the last case, Friday evening, maybe 7 p.m., knowing that you can go home and this patient is not going to come back, that's a great comfort as well. So there's, uh, there's a lot of benefits for everybody. Of course, the nurses do less work as well. So I would say workflow improves, uh, the economy in the hospital should improve because we're avoiding a lot of complications which cost money, whatever way you measure it. But most of all, and I, and I do wish to stress this, most of all, we are very pleased that our work improves the, the health and safety of our patients because that's the first obligation for everybody and of course all of the doctors feel the same way about that. It's very satisfying to, to be working in a, in a technology area that is beneficial for our patients. And I worked in the operating room in the anesthesia department for 10 years before I got into business and uh, I've always been in healthcare. So the, the, the first feeling is of satisfaction that what we do uh, makes people better. We, we certainly, from our clinical research, very uh, 
peer-reviewed, strong studies save lives, uh, reduce suffering, and, and that's the most important thing. Out of that come uh, many other consequences, uh, economic benefit, uh, workflow benefits in the hospital, and so on. Uh, and of course that's important because every country deals with the challenge of an aging population, more sick people, fewer resources, and a strain on uh, government budgets or insurance uh, payers. So to lower the total cost of care in any setting is important, and, and we know we do that even in countries which have national health services, like Mexico. Uh, we measure in Canada, in Australia, in Germany. In Australia, we have a reimbursement from the government because they looked at a large amount of data and found that it was beneficial to use our device, and so they encouraged the use in the national health system in Australia because even though they have a single-payer system, like uh, Mexico, and they have a, a higher tier for wealthier people who buy private insurance, but most people have national health care in Australia. Even in that setting, we have demonstrated that it's cost effective to use the device. And we have data from Germany and Canada which supports that. So the economics are very important. And I suppose the final thing is that when we started this, the idea of retained blood syndrome didn't exist. And I, I don't want to make it sound um, too clever, but we did make up the term didn't exist before Clearflow. We invented the idea of calling all of these problems something. Uh, before that, it was many different things, and all of them represented a tax on the surgery, one way or the other. And I like to joke uh, with surgeons that we lowered their tax rate on their surgery by describing retained blood syndrome, by showing them a single root cause, which they can deal with directly, and by avoiding this root cause, they can lower the tax rate on their surgery directly and everybody benefits like that.